Welcome, everyone, to this Lee Kuan Yew School event on the occasion of the launch of Frank Fukuyama's new book, Liberalism and Its Discontents. Warm welcome, Professor Fukuyama himself. It is 12.15 now in Singapore, so it must be late in the evening for you in Palo Alto. Uh, this book is... Uh, in the, to paraphrase the New York Times, represents Frank Fukuyama at his best, the wisest of our thinkers digging into the soil of our predicament. In a second, Frank will, I will turn the, the, the focus over to Frank for him to make his presentation. And indeed, he will argue no less that liberalism, the title of this book, Liberalism is the best hope for 21st century democracy. Now, normally at this point, someone might introduce the speaker. I have no need to do so. Frank Fukuyama straddles the world of academic deep thinking and popular imagination. He is a household name. His thinking crosses boundaries on economics, political science, public policy. As we begin, as I hand over to Frank, I want to just remind the audience that we've got a little bit under an hour and 15 minutes of airtime. Frank has agreed to speak for approximately 30 minutes, but I have suggested to him to be elastic with that time in whatever way it takes to represent best the ideas he wants to communicate to us. After Frank's presentation, we will have a combined discussion and question and answer with the audience that's zoomed in. Just want to remind everyone, please submit your questions in the Q&A function chat box that appears on each of your Zoom screens. With that, Frank, over to you. So uh, thank you very much, Danny. I hope everybody can hear me uh, adequately. It's a great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce my uh, book uh, in Asia at the uh, Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, I regret I'm not there in person. It's been several years since I visited uh, Singapore and uh, the LKY School. Uh, and I have uh, a number of friends and colleagues there. And so it's very, um, uh, it, it's very hospitable that uh, you've given me this opportunity to talk about my new book. Uh, I think that uh, the reason I wrote it is that global politics, in my view, is at a pretty important crossroads uh, in which liberal ideas are being sharply contested and threatened from both the left and the right uh, in different parts of the world, and it's being threatened geopolitically. Uh, I think right now the war that is going on between Russia and Ukraine following Russia's invasion of Ukraine is really um, a contest between uh, an ethno-nationalist uh, power and a fundamentally liberal uh, uh, state. Uh, and the issue really is whether uh, that liberal state is going to be allowed to exercise its own choice and sovereignty as to its national identity uh, in the face of, um, you know, uh, sheer military power. And that fight is going to have echoes around the world, has echoes in Asia, uh, where there's another great authoritarian power, China, uh, that is waiting in the wings and I think probably watching the contest in Ukraine quite closely. So what I want to do, uh, and the reason I wrote the book, is to basically defend liberalism as a doctrine and explain why it's actually worth fighting for, why it leads to a better uh, way of life. I want to talk about some of the threats that have grown up uh, to liberalism, uh, a bit of an explanation of how uh, we got to the present point where those liberal principles are uh, under attack. Uh, and then, you know, I think probably conclude with some thoughts about the current uh, geopolitical situation, because that obviously uh, 
is of great relevance to everybody in, uh, in Singapore. So let me just begin. This is an academic institution and I'm an academic, so I need to begin with certain definitions. And I'm going to begin with a definition uh, of what I mean by liberalism. There's different ways that word is used in different parts of the world. In America, it simply refers to left of center politics, you know, the politics of the Democratic Party. In Europe, it usually refers to a center right party that's very pro free market, like the uh, the German Free Democrats. Uh, but that neither of those is the definition I'm using. I'm using a more philosophical definition. And probably the easiest way is to simply read uh, John Gray's definition. John Gray has written several books. You know, the English philosopher has written uh, a couple of books about liberalism. He characterizes the doctrine in the following manner. He says, it is individualist in that it asserts the moral primacy of the person against the claims of any social collectivity. It's egalitarian inasmuch as it confers on all men the same moral status and denies the relevance to legal and political order of differences in moral worth among human beings. It is universalist, affirming the moral unity of the human species and according a secondary importance to specific historic associations and cultural forms. And finally, meliorist in its affirmation of the corrigibility and improvability of all social and political institutions. Uh, I think that liberalism is in practical terms associated with certain um, institutions, in particular with the rule of law, uh, where the law serves as a limit on state power. It defines the limits of state power. Uh, if you're living in a liberal constitutional order, uh, you usually have a definition of separated powers that check and balance the power of the executive so that executives cannot simply do uh, whatever they want and individual leaders cannot um, simply choose to do whatever they want. Uh, so you can see it fundamentally as a, a, a constraint on power that protects a, a sphere uh, of individual autonomy. It does that by granting people rights, uh, rights to belief, to speech, to association, uh, and in, if the country is a, also a liberal democracy to uh, some degree of uh, political participation uh, and self-rule. And so that means that there's quite a lot of liberal societies. It's not associated with a particular economic uh, set of policies. So I think that social democratic Sweden or Denmark uh, qualify as liberal societies, so does Japan. I would say, you know, that uh, Singapore is a largely liberal society. Singapore has uh, a strong rule of law, a strong tradition of law. That's part of the reason that it has been uh, so economically uh, successful. Uh, I should note that my book is a defense of liberalism and not of democracy. Liberalism and democracy are separable. Uh, you can have a liberal state uh, without its necessarily being democratic in the sense of having free uh, multi-party elections. And you can have a democracy that's not particularly liberal uh, in that it doesn't respect the rule of law and these constraints on executive power. And we see uh, examples of that. Typically, when you're teaching comparative politics, you'll people will point to Singapore in the first instance as a state that is liberal but not fully democratic in in the sense of permitting a uh, i mean we can argue about this but in the sense of permitting you know a, a fully uh, even playing field for all political parties but it is definitely a liberal state on the other hand we've seen the rise of illiberal democracies uh, victor orban in hungary a few years ago gave a speech in which he said that his objective uh, with his form of populist rule was to create an illiberal democracy in which uh, he's voted into power by uh, through elections, but he doesn't necessarily respect um, these limitations on power. And so sure enough, uh, he's put a lot of his cronies in charge of the media. He's suppressed, um, you know, real debate in that country, freedom of speech uh, and the like. And so you can have uh, 
then an example of an illiberal democracy in which the rule of law uh, comes under uh, attack. The other thing that I think is important about the liberal tradition is a cognitive approach. Liberalism historically was very much associated with uh, the scientific method, the idea that there is an objective world beyond our subjective consciousness, that we can apprehend that objective world through an experimental method, uh, and we can use that knowledge to manipulate the world through the application of science uh, to technology. And that is the basis on which we've built uh, the modern economic world, the uh, constant technological innovation that takes place uh, in liberal societies that use this particular method. All right, so that's, that's liberalism. I think there are three basic reasons why a liberal society is a good society. Uh, and those are pragmatic, moral, and economic. The pragmatic side of liberalism has to do with diversity. And uh, you can see the way this works if you look at the historical origins of liberalism. The first liberal thinkers arose in the middle of the 17th century in Europe after Europe's wars of religion. Following the Protestant Reformation, Europe experienced about 150 years of almost continuous religious warfare. During the 30 years war in Central Europe, maybe 30% of the population died as a result, either directly of the war of hunger and uh, disease that followed on conflict. And at the end of that period, a number of important thinkers got up and said, well, maybe it's not such a great idea that we build our political system around a particular religious doctrine or religious sect because we cannot agree on these religious ideas. We can't agree on the good life. So what we want to do is lower the horizon of politics to life itself. Uh, and we need to tolerate uh, other ways of uh, thinking about final questions. We're not going to agree on uh, what the good life is. And so let's agree that we'll simply have life itself, the right to life, uh, that we can live in peace. And this implies that the cardinal liberal virtue is tolerance, that you're willing to tolerate people uh, that are different from you. Liberalism was then challenged again in the 19th and 20th centuries by uh, rising nationalism in which uh, uh, leaders uh, sought to define national identity in very specific ways rooted in biology, race, uh, ethnicity. Uh, and this laid the groundwork for the two world wars in the 20th century and the first half of the 20th century. And once again, you know, at the end of that conflict, uh, Europeans got up and said, this is not a very good uh, way to live. We need to have a liberal world order uh, in which uh, we tolerate national differences this time. Um, and that's the basis of the European Union and many of the liberal institutions that then grew up uh, in the wake of the Second uh, World War. So that's the pragmatic reason. If you live in a diverse society, you need to have people get along and therefore uh, you need to uh, embed a principle of tolerance uh, uh, by not defining uh, you know, the higher ends of life, but leaving that up to individuals. The second um, argument for liberalism is a moral argument and that has to do with human autonomy. Uh, you know, the basic liberal premise is that we are moral agents and that we can make choices and that actually human flourishing and happiness is built around the ability to freely make choices about what I'm going to do in life, who I'm going to marry, where I'm going to live, how I'm going to travel, these basic uh, freedoms uh, that people want to exercise uh, are basic to the moral understanding of human dignity. And uh, as the John Gray quote at the beginning uh, indicated, liberals believe that this moral uh, uh, ability to, the, the, the ability to choose is something universally shared uh, among all human beings and that the liberal order exists to protect that autonomy. Uh, and therefore the dignity of each human being that lives uh, in a liberal society. Uh, and then the final uh, 
uh, argument in favor of liberalism is economic. Among the, among the uh, forms of autonomy that liberalism protects is the right to own property and the right to transact. Uh, and liberal regimes have been associated with property rights, contract enforcement, a rule of law that permits commerce to take place uh, right from the beginning. The first countries to break out of the Malthusian trap and begin to modernize were liberal uh, uh, countries like England and the Netherlands uh, that allowed freedom of commerce. And you know, what we've seen over time is the growth of a liberal world order that is based on the protection of property rights and the protection uh, offered by law uh, of commerce. And I would say that, you know, if you look at a country like China, it is not a liberal political order, but China would not have grown the way it has since 1978 if it did not accept certain basic liberal principles. Uh, China created quasi property rights so that, you know, peasants that had been working on collective farms could actually keep uh, the, the surplus that they produced on their on their uh, land, uh, which led to a great uh, increase in the productivity of Chinese agriculture. Uh, there's a vibrant private sector in China that's been the driver of a lot of uh, China's growth, and that would not happen but for liberal uh, economic policies. It's just that China has separated political liberalism from uh, from economic liberalism. But the prosperity that's created by uh, uh, liberal economics has been, you know, the third great argument uh, in favor of uh, of liberalism. And the liberal world order is one that has led to an enormous uh, reduction of poverty. Uh, over the past three generations, it's led to, well, you know, global output quadrupled between the 1970s and the uh, early 2000s. And I think a lot of the prosperity that we've enjoyed has come about because of liberal uh, economics. Now, that's the argument. That's the argument in favor of liberalism, but it's come under threat from uh, quite a lot of sources. I think right now, the biggest threat comes from a nationalist right, and it's really represented by Vladimir Putin. Putin gave an interview to the Financial Times in 2019, in which he said that liberalism was an obsolete doctrine uh, and that uh, it needed to be replaced by a more muscular form of uh, essentially ethno-nationalism. And that's the kind of doctrine that uh, he has used uh, to govern Russia, and it's one that is increasingly common in many uh, parts of the world. So Viktor Orban in Hungary that I mentioned has tried to define Hungarian national identity in terms of Hungarian ethnicity. Uh, in India, uh, Prime Minister Modi and the BJP have tried to shift um, Indian national uh, identity away from the liberal vision of Gandhi and Nehru and the founders uh, of modern India uh, to one that's based on Hindu nationalism. And I think there you can see the pragmatic dangers that are posed by that. Uh, you know, the kinds of communal rioting that occurred in Gujarat when Modi was the chief minister there, uh, it seems to me potentially could recur in an India that tries to define itself as a Hindu nation rather than a, a liberal one, given the fact that, you know, there's some 200 million Muslims living in that country and others that are not uh, part of that Hindu uh, community. Uh, many people on the right feel that liberalism doesn't offer a strong enough sense of community and they want something that is uh, stricter and narrower, either based on some religious uh, views or based on a certain cultural uh, tradition uh, that is more narrowly uh, nationalist. And so uh, we see, you know, across the world, a decline in liberal uh, regimes. Uh, there's been a 16 year period in which liberal democracy has declined across the world, according to uh, Freedom House. And um, the international dimension really joins hands with the uh, 
domestic one because one of the things that has been happening uh, in many established liberal democracies, including the United States, is the rise of populist right-wing parties that are similarly nationalist and uh, in the first instance seek to dismantle uh, the domestic rule of law. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry to say that the prime example of that is really the United States, where Donald Trump was elected in 2016 on a platform of Make America Great, a sort of classical, you know, nationalist nostalgia for an imagined time when the country was much better than it was. It didn't have so many foreigners. It didn't have so much uh, diversity. And like many populists, you know, he said, well, I was elected and therefore uh, I express in my person the will of the people. And the first thing he attacked is the rule of law. You know, he wanted his attorney general to uh, charge Hillary Clinton and put her in jail uh, and, um, you know, rejected, uh, you know, the rulings of judges. And then probably the worst single act uh, that, you know, he did while he was uh, president was to not accept the outcome of the 2020 election and claim that it was uh, fraudulent. And as a result, the country is or remains, you know, highly polarized with a substantial number of Americans who don't believe that the last election was uh, was free and fair, uh, who turned to violence on January 6th when they stormed the Capitol. And so there was a breakdown in the peaceful transfer of power that is the hallmark of, uh, uh, of a democracy. But, you know, this is part of a broader uh, international movement. Um, uh, and it's actually quite interesting that Putin is at the center of a lot of these right-wing networks. So Marine Le Pen, for example, in France, who is shortly going to run against Emmanuel Macron for the presidency of France, has a similar uh, kind of make France great again uh, agenda. She also likes Putin and admires him. And I think the reason that these nationalists like Putin is precisely because they're not liberal. They're not constrained by law. They can do whatever they want. Uh, they're, they're, they're strong leaders that don't have to worry about legislatures and, and judges and uh, people telling them that they can't do certain things. They just go and uh, do it. And, um, you know, virtually every country in Europe now has one of these right-wing anti-immigrant, uh, anti-liberal parties. And it's a, you know, continuing danger to the liberal order. I think that there's also uh, a left-wing threat. Uh, we in the United States uh, see this with the rise of identity politics, where you have people who challenge the liberal premise of universal human equality uh, and kind of equal moral worth. They do it out of a position that, you know, is, is justified because, um, you know, they say that there are historically marginalized communities, African Americans, women, homosexuals and lesbians, uh, transgender people, and you cannot simply accept the liberal premise that we're all born equal because, in fact, we're not born equal. If you're a member of one of these groups, uh, you've been subject to repression and unjust hierarchy, and therefore the demand is not that uh, the liberal society live up to its liberal principles, but rather that those principles be replaced by um, uh, group identities or group recognition. And, you know, for a whole variety of reasons, I think if you look uh, at places that have tried to implement group recognition, it's not a very pretty picture. You know, there are many countries that uh, where identity politics has gotten out of control. I would point to Bosnia, Syria, Iraq, uh, Libya. I mean, these are all countries in which you have self-regarding uh, ethnic identity groups that are more loyal to their own group rather than to the larger entity. They're not loyal, uh, you know, to Syria or Iraq uh, uh, or Lebanon. They're, they're loyal to the particular faction that their uh, identity group uh, represents. And that is not a very stable uh, situation. And that's not one that's very conducive to uh, domestic peace. Now, 
question is, how did we get to this situation in which you have these challenges to the liberal order? And I think there's basically uh, two processes that went on both on the right and on the left that explain how we got here. Uh, on the right, uh, uh, well, both of these processes went through a similar kind of evolution where you took a good liberal principle and you stretched it to the point where it couldn't bear the weight anymore and it became too extreme. So on the right, uh, this was the evolution of economic liberalism into what's called neoliberalism, uh, which is really associated with the rise of a certain kind of market economics associated with Milton Friedman and the University of Chicago. Uh, they start from a correct premise that market economies produce prosperity, but they kind of uh, absolutize that to a worship of the market and a corresponding denigration of the state. The state was the enemy of economic growth, of efficiency, and therefore it was important to dismantle uh, as much of the state uh, as possible. And this produced a world uh, that was highly deregulated. In certain respects, the, those changes were good because in the 1970s and 80s, when this form of neoliberalism got going, uh, many countries were, in fact, overregulated. There are too many state-owned enterprises and too much uh, interference in, in you know, the activities of entrepreneurs and the like. Uh, but it got carried to uh, too much of an extreme. It produced a great deal of inequality because that's what happens when you have markets that are not constrained by uh, politics, basically. Uh, and it led to a great deal of instability. So it was really the deregulation of American financial markets um, that led to the great uh, financial uh, crash, uh, the subprime crisis in 2008. Uh, and that fueled the rise of populism because the people that designed that system, that financial system, did well. You know, they recovered after a couple of years. But Millions of Americans, poor Americans, lost their homes, lost their jobs uh, as a result. And I think the populist anger uh, at that outcome was one of the reasons that you had the rise of Donald Trump in 2016. On the other side, um, uh, you had an absolutization of uh, this idea of individual autonomy. So I think at a very basic level, you know, this is a universally shared uh, trait that people really do want to be able to make decisions for themselves. They don't like to be told what to do. But on the left, uh, on the progressive left, you had a kind of worship of autonomy for autonomy's sake. You know, it was less important what choices you made uh, than the fact that you were making choices. And it was the right of everybody to rebel against whatever moral framework uh, existed, whatever culture uh, was handed down by one's family, by one's neighbors, by uh, one's society. Uh, and that kind of constant breaking of social norms in favor of individual self-expression uh, was very corrosive to the idea of community. And it led to uh, you know, a very virulent form of identity politics that then becomes illiberal because it attacks uh, you know, certain liberal ideas regarding freedom of speech, of due process, uh, and the like. And this is something that I think has been, you know, visible on American university campuses, in the arts, in Hollywood, in uh, other places where you get a certain orthodoxy regarding uh, a certain interpretation of identity politics, and then the cancellation of people that, you know, don't um, uh, follow that uh, orthodoxy. Now, I have to say that between the threat from the right and the threat from the left, the threat from the right is very immediate. Uh, we have a big problem in the United States because, uh, you know, the Republican, many Republicans are actually preparing for the 2024 election and they're trying to change the way that votes are being counted so that even if they lose the election uh, through the popular vote, they can still appoint electors and override uh, that popular outcome. And if that happens, it's going to really lead to really the most serious constitutional crisis in the U.S. since the Civil War. Uh, and so that's a very clear and present danger. I think the threat from the left is a little bit longer term. Uh, it's a cultural threat. 
uh, that affects the way that people think about issues like race, gender, uh, ethnicity, and so forth. And it makes people self-censor uh, rather than having the government you know, censor. Uh, the cognitive side of this is very interesting because you have an attack on modern natural science and the idea of the objectivity of science that really started uh, on the left. Uh, I have a chapter in the book that describes this evolution. Uh, you begin with structuralism in France that uh, was based on the writings of a Swiss linguist named Ferdinand de Saussure, who began to argue that language did not refer to an objective reality beyond the speaker, but actually the act of speaking created that reality in many ways. And it led to an increasing view that uh, language was a subjective matter in which people willfully imposed uh, their ideas and their power on other people, on society, on uh, even on the material world. Uh, and it evolved you know, from structuralism through post-structuralism to post-modernism. Here, the key thinker, I think, was Michel Foucault, who in a series of very brilliant books argued that modern natural science actually was not objective. It was actually a kind of conspiracy in which existing elites that held power uh, were using the, the language of science to defend their own hierarchy. Uh, and that this was true with regard to incarceration, with regard to homosexuality, with regard to disease, to madness, to a lot of things where uh, they weren't, you know, the, the, the elites were not using overt power, they were using language uh, to fool people into thinking that something was objective when it really was simply an expression of the power of these elites. And if this argument sounds familiar, it's because it's now drifted over to the, uh, to the populist right. Uh, we saw this during the COVID epidemic where, um, you know, a lot of people on the right would say that the public health authorities that are, by the way, this is not so much true in Asia because, <laughs> you know, in Asia, you're much more def uh, deferential to authority, but certainly in many Western countries, uh, you had people, on, especially on the right, questioning the authority of the public health authorities that were saying that you needed to wear masks, that vaccines were safe, uh, and so forth. And you now have this amazing situation in many countries where you've got a strong right-wing movement that's built around skepticism about vaccines. Um, uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a clear example of a attack on science that began on the left and then drifted over to the right. And then the final thing I would say is that technology has greatly uh, enhanced this weakening of our cognitive agreement on just empirical facts. Uh, the internet, when it was introduced in the 1990s, was initially seen by many people as a great force for democracy because information was power, everybody would have access to information. Now, in certain ways, that has actually been true. Uh, it is much easier to get information, but it's also much easier to get disinformation and to spread disinformation and conspiracy theories and hate speech and a lot of other uh, things that are not so socially useful. And the world that has been created is one in which these large internet platforms like Google and Facebook and Twitter have a global reach in which they can amplify certain messages over others. And for the most part, their business model uh, doesn't lead them to uh, try to moderate the quality of speech. It wants to increase the virality of speech. And therefore, it's been in the self-interest of these companies to uh, promote, you know, the worst forms of conspiracy theory because that's what gets the most clicks uh, and eyeballs uh, from their users. Uh, so technology has, you know, contributed to, uh, in a way, the collapse of a shared cognitive framework about uh, what the empirical reality of the world is. You know, are vaccines safe? Who won the last election? Uh, these now have become contested issues. So let me uh, just conclude by 
you know, saying that this all feeds back into geopolitics, uh, because I do think, you know, there's a there's a a range of uh, approaches to political institutions, but they have increasingly been grouped around liberal and illiberal ones. Um, I think that um, there's a, you know, there's been for a long time an alliance of liberal democracies represented by NATO, by the US, Japan, US, South Korea, you know, alliances and so forth. Uh, there's a growing network of authoritarian states um, uh, anchored by um, uh, the growing uh, cooperation between Russia and China, but it's an alliance that includes a lot of other states like Syria, Iran, Venezuela, uh, uh, and the like uh, that are distinctly illiberal. They don't share an economic ideology. Some of them are on the left and some of them are on the right in terms of 20th century politics, uh, but they share a, a kind of common opposition to, uh, to liberal politics. Uh, and then there's you know, countries that are kind of in the middle, that they're democratic, but not terribly liberal. Um, you know, India, I think, is increasingly occupying that uh, position. Uh, and um, power makes a great deal of difference. And so I think that the apparent success of one of these forms of political uh, and economic organization uh, is going to, you know, gain a, a followers and attraction if it's seen as effective. Uh, for a long time, China uh, held that uh, role because it was growing so rapidly, it was very stable. Uh, whether it can hold on to that position, we'll have to see. I think that the current uh, pandemic has tested the limits of that model because, you know, I mean, quite frankly, I think that the Chinese are involved in a crazy policy of maintaining zero COVID in the face of, uh, you know, the scale of the epidemic that they're, they're doing. Uh, but that's a choice that could only be made by a really illiberal state that really didn't have to respect, uh, you know, the rights of, uh, uh, of its citizens. Uh, and similarly, there's a uh, there is a, a struggle playing out in Ukraine where the Russian model uh, is being tested. Uh, and, you know, at this moment, it doesn't look like it's doing very well uh, because the military power, uh, which was a lot of its claim to legitimacy, doesn't look uh, nearly as strong as it did, you know, prior to the invasion. And there's nothing worse than a strong man that actually isn't strong, uh, that uh, looks foolish and, and, you know, looks like he's made a big mistake. Uh, so let me leave it there. Um, uh, there's a lot of issues to talk about and I welcome any comments or, and um, uh, uh, if, um, yeah, so I look forward to uh, a further discussion. Um, thank you, Frank. Well, wonderful tour through the key ideas in your, in your new book. Uh, really wonderful to hear you expand on on the themes that you've been that you've developed so beautifully in the book. Can I to begin? Can I take exception to one of the phrases that you used? Uh, in Asia, you are much more deferential to authority. Uh, whatever the validity of a statement like that might be for a whole range of issues. I think its application in the particular instance that you were talking about, uh, you know, the reaction of many people in the West to, to the kinds of anti-COVID, to the kinds of COVID containment measures and the depths of our sort of struggle, the global pandemic uh, with, with uh, COVID. I, I, th I wonder if there's some uh, perhaps reinterpretation of what actually happened in Asia. An alternative view is that in Asia, we were simply fully cognizant of the last 900 years of scientific rationalist humanism. We deferred to experts. We believed that experts had consulted properly with policymakers. We did not give in to a postmodernist subjectiveness of how facts could be malleable. Scientific facts were scientific facts. 
And I think the behavior of Asia through the COVID pandemic reflects much more that positive feature than it does a negative one. Uh, I, I think we could probably debate this, but let me just leave it as as a, a point. Well, that I, I no, I don't. I don't disagree with that. I do think that that's one of the reasons that people were more deferential to uh, scientific authority because they actually believed the science, and I think that they that was correct. The other thing has to do with the you know the quality of of the state, um, because in Asia, uh, you know, this is really the argument I made in my political order series that. You know, uh, the state has a very long tradition in uh, in Asia, and it's a very effective state. And the degree, the degree of trust that you have in the government is partly a reflection of your experience with that government if it's performed well. And when it does perform well, people trust it, and so therefore they're willing to defer to the authority of you know um, state authorities. And I think that was also uh, that was also going on. Yes, exactly. I mean, there's a there's a circularity in how we argue this. When the state is effective, of course, we want the citizen to listen to what the state says, and it does so effectively, uh, and and the outcome is good for everyone. When the state is ineffective, then obviously there does need to be that skepticism, but that skepticism should not be allowed to drift over into the the Fauci's and other scientific experts that we do have around us. Uh, can I build on that on on to, to bring this back to some of the the ideas that you've uh, that that appear in your book, one one of the themes that you con you come back to is the the centrality of the individual, rule of law, checks and balances, the rules that we need to put in place, the institutions that we need to put in place to guard against, uh, you know, uh, 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 possible possible governments that are transgression of governments against the rights of the individual. Now, the, uh, the discussion that you and I have just had about how in Asia, an effective strong state comes hand in hand with belief by the citizen that that state has properly consulted experts and we're going ahead with the right thing. So my question to you is why is it that in, a, in the liberal system, in a liberal system where there's constant refer referring back to checks and balances, constant referring back to how elections allow people to choose their governments. Why is it that that system continues to elect governments that you then don't trust, that you then have to build checks and balances against? Well, what is it um, about that liberal system that, that produces that? <laughs> You know, quite frankly, Asia has had its fill of um, bad rulers, right? It's not as if every Asian country has somehow been run by Lee Kuan Yew, you know, uh, somebody that really had public interest in mind that kept corruption under control. And, you know, if you go to China itself, um, I think that this, you know, the, the single weakness, biggest weakness of the Chinese system is the problem of what uh, in Chinese history has been called the bad emperor problem. Uh, essentially, the Chinese have a, a system of unchecked power uh, where you don't have serious obstacles to a ruler uh, that gains charismatic power and then can make a decision to do whatever uh, he wants. And that was Mao Zedong, you know, in the Great Leap Forward and then especially in the Cultural Revolution. You had, you know, absolutely devastating, uh, devastatingly bad policy and no way to stop it because there were no checks and balances in that system. And so uh, I think that, you know, the, the liberal system of checks and balances is in a way a, a, a ma matter of risk management, uh, that you couldn't have a tyrant like Mao arise in a democratic country. And in fact, I think even with Donald Trump, you saw the checks and balances working because there are a lot of things that I think were bad policies that he wanted to do. You know, he wanted to build this border wall and uh, he wanted to get rid of Obamacare and, you know, various things. He couldn't do it because, you know, we have these checks built into the system so that a president can't simply just issue a decree and, you know, have it done. Uh, but it doesn't work that way in the Chinese system. 
Uh, and so we'll see whether Xi Jinping is a wise ruler down the road or whether he turns into a bad emperor. But if he, in fact, is a bad emperor, there's not anything that anyone can do about it because he's accumulated this kind of personalistic power uh, that really has, um, you know, that really has no limits. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's a good reason uh, why you want a system that manages political risk, you know, in the way I, I have also argued elsewhere that in the United States and certain other democracies, we have too many checks and balances. Uh, you know, it leads to a situation that I labeled vetocracy, meaning rule by veto, where so many stakeholders can stop things from happening. And it makes it very difficult to do things like build infrastructure or, you know, engage in kind of collective, you know, actions of various sorts. Uh, and that's not a good thing either. Uh, but I would rather be towards that end towards, than towards a completely unchecked uh, Chinese end, uh, you know, where the state really doesn't have to respect the, the rights and, and interests of uh, stakeholders when it wants to do something. Thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you for that clarification. I, I have one more point that I'd like to make before I turn over to the, the sort of wave of questions that comes in. And it builds on what, what you and I were just talking about. The, I mean, the subtlety and richness in your argument that looks at examples and thinks about qualifications and thinks about how even in, in less than ideal circumstances, there might be good things that emerge, even in what seems to be ideal circumstances, there is a possibility of, of, a, of so a, a corruption of the principles of that system. In this rich world that, that, that you describe for us, that you've constructed for us, uh, it's a very different world than one where perhaps not, not you yourself, but others who try and take your ideas and run with them construct and tell about the world you know but actually even you and when, when you know we were talking about um, uh, you know, when, when you began your presentation here and you spoke about how the russian invasion of ukraine is a reflection of the large forces uh at play between liberalism and authoritarianism and you refer to how in asia china is waiting in the wings china another authoritarian state now the a contradiction that I see between your rich nuanced discussion and this stylization of geopolitical conflict is one that seems to me a little bit at odds. Pra the, the pragmatism argument and liberalism is for you a way to lower the temperature on violence and conflict. But at the same time, when elevated to the arena of geopolitics, all of a sudden it becomes liberalism on the one hand, authoritarianism on the other. It doesn't seem to me that the world has to be zero one binary in that way. But those who use the liberalism argument to set it up in contradistinction with those those parts of the world that are not liberal seem to be using liberalism in a way to raise the temperature on geopolitics. And that doesn't seem to me consistent with how you think pragmatism should drive us the other direction. Well, I look. If you uh, if you look at uh, China's relationship to the rest of the world, uh, it's not liberals that have been raising the temperature, you know, on on China. Uh, you know, liberals did not make the Chinese crack down on uh, individual freedoms. You know, in two thousand thirteen, when Xi Jinping took over, I would say that China was a pretty well institutionalized and fairly ordinary authoritarian regime uh, that permitted a, you know, a fair amount of individual freedom. I remember going to China you know, frequently in that period and you know, academic friends of mine would criticize the government, would you know, talk about the high level politics going on in the standing committee of the Politburo, who was up, who was down, complain about you know, various things. You can't do that in China now. You know, Xi Jinping has implemented a much, much tougher form of, you know, illiberalism uh, that has really snuffed out all of that. You know, every academic department in a Chinese university now has got a commissar sitting in the faculty meetings, uh, 
listening for somebody to say something that you know contradicts the the the, the line. Liberals were enforcing that on China. This is a this is a thing that China has done itself. Nobody was forcing China to build all of these military bases on these islands in the South China Sea. That was a decision that China made all by itself. Uh, you know, the kind of um, personal control that the social credit system has enabled that has now been doubled down on by because of the pandemic uh, and, you know, China's you know, desire to control the minute behavior of every one of its citizens. Again, this is not something that anybody from the outside was imposing on China. The Chinese decided to do this all on their own. So I really don't think that if you talk about who's been raising the temperature, uh, you know, I, I don't think that you can blame it on, uh, on liberals uh, in the West because you know, the Chinese system has been uh, evolving. Similarly, uh, I don't think that you can attribute the changes that have gone on in India, uh, you know, these the turn towards illiberalism uh, under the Modi government uh, to anything, you know, coming from liberals on the outside. I mean, this is something that they are responsible for, you know, Modi and the BJP are responsible for. Uh, so, you know, I guess I don't think that uh, it's, if you want to know what's been raising the temperature in global politics, I, I really don't think that the, you know, the, the momentum has been on the liberal side. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me turn to uh, a, a grouping of questions that have come in. So a first group of questions that I'd like to pose to you, Frank, has to do with the global climate crisis, the environmental crisis. Is it because in a way that's in terms of magnitude that's on the opposite end it's it's global and it's existential and when we talk about liberalism there's a great emphasis on the individual you've referred to the community but liberals might have some uh, difficulty with extending beyond that to society uh, uh, to, a, to a, on a larger scale and then on a global scale the global environmental crisis how does the global environmental crisis factor into your thinking about any about the crisis in liberalism. Uh, well, there's a lot of different things to, to be uh, uh, to be said about that. Um, one of the chapters in my book is about really how the uh, how liberalism actually needs the nation state. Uh, that although liberalism is a doctrine that proclaims uh, the universality of uh, human equality, uh, equality can actually be enforced only within a territorially delimited nation that has the power to actually do that enforcement. And therefore, um, you can't have a liberal society without it being embedded in a nation. And, you know, I argue that um, the global things like the global climate crisis or the pandemic or global terrorism or money laundering. I mean, there's all sorts of problems that cross international boundaries. There are certain people that have argued that in order to meet that challenge, uh, you're going to need to create new global institutions uh, and somehow delegate power away from existing nation states uh, to some kind of global body that actually has the power to do something. And I think this is a very bad idea. Uh, I, I simply don't think that this is going to work because, um, well, just as a matter of practical politics, can you imagine either China or the United States agreeing to give up sovereignty over its own territory to an international body that's going to tell it, you know, you can't build that power plant here or you have to meet this standard. And if you don't, we're going to come in a rescue. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Uh, so I think that, you know, a global challenge needs to be met in the way that it is being met right now, which is through the cooperation of existing uh, nation states. Now, there is this argument about whether authoritarian government or uh, liberal democracies are better at dealing with climate, uh, the challenges of climate. And here, I think you have to separate two different um, issues. Uh, 
The first is, do you take the problem seriously to the point that you're actually going to do something potentially costly in order to uh, solve the problem? And I don't think that there's any particular advantage that authoritarian states have over um, you know, liberal democracies in that regard, uh, because you know, essentially we emit carbon because we grow economically and every state wants to grow China is not particularly virtuous in that respect. Um, you know, they've agreed that they're going to cut out coal-fired power plants from the Belt and Road Initiative, but they're still building a lot of coal-fired power plants domestically in China. And if you look at estimates by the uh, uh, International Energy Agency uh, over the next 30 years, you know, the largest emitter of carbon by far is going to be China. Uh, so in that respect, I'm not sure that simply being authoritarian gives you a particular advantage. I do think that uh, once a country decides that it wants to do something about climate, either in terms of mitigation or adaptation, that there is a certain advantage to having an authoritarian system because, um, you know, it's this vitocracy problem that I talked about that, uh, you know, when you approach a big infrastructure project in many democracies, uh, we have a governance system that is so respectful of the rights and interests of stakeholders that might be, you know, hurt in, in the process of seeking this kind of collective uh, good that we, we, we can't build stuff. And the Chinese are obviously very good at building stuff. Uh, uh, so, you know, once you make the decision to go ahead, I do think that there is a certain a potential authoritarian advantage. Um, uh, but, you know, whether you make that decision in the first place, I think is kind of independent of regime type. The, you know, an alternative way to, to couch this problem of the global environmental crisis is that there are such things called global public goods. And global public goods, like ordinary public goods, are not well served by an individual oriented uh, system of engagement, whether you think about that as the marketplace or whatever else, whatever other political analog. And if we do have this problem of global public goods that are under supply, global climate crisis is just one of them, then it seems inevitable that even the precepts of neoliberalism have to give way. I mean, you know, far less the kind of pulled in uh, uh, liberalism that you described, but even neoliberalism market fundamentalism would give way to say that we do need an institutional solution that steps yeah, but, outside but the look, boundaries of individual choice. Individual choice is the wrong way to think about it. I think that um, liberal democracies actually have a very good record in providing uh, global public goods. If you look at who, who are the biggest sources of development assistance to, to poor countries these days, uh, it is, you know, rich liberal democracies. I mean, they're the ones that have committed, many of them, to, you know, providing 0.7% of GDP to development assistance. Uh, and, um, you know, that's something that's a collective decision taken. You know, it, it's, it's not as if individuals are resisting this. Collectively, democracies have stepped up to a lot of these challenges of providing global public goods. There are other kinds of public goods like security, uh, like a global trading system. Uh, those are public goods that were provided unilaterally by the United States for you know, several generations. Uh, so I simply don't think that you know, the individualism of a liberal democracy means that as a collectivity uh, that you know, liberal societies aren't capable on a global scale of producing public goods. Uh, and in fact, I suspect that their record on that is better than illiberal societies. Um, yeah, I suppose, you know, approaching this from a perspective, perhaps wrongly as an economist, I don't think of the, the challenge as being one of liberal versus illiberal either in terms of provision of global public goods, is whether we overcome the externalities. And the externalities are obviously not, uh, not taken into account when we approach this from the problem of individual-oriented decision-making. And 
if within nations we are willing to subscribe to the notion that that boundary of liberalism has to be reined in because the nation state needs to take over internalizing this externality. It seems to me the logic of the argument leads to that being a form of kind of global decision making. Uh, well, if you can describe to me what a global institution would look like that is both politically feasible and safe in, in the sense of both having enough power to actually accomplish the provision of these global public goods without, you know, then misusing that power, I'd love to hear it. Uh, but I, you know, I just don't see a, a plan for creation, uh, creating such a supranational institution that, that, you know, has the remotest chance of actually being put into effect. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Let me, uh, I will take up the challenge. I hope on another occasion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I want to uh, get to a very specific question that's come in from uh, Mr. William Ng in the audience. And that very specific question is this. Uh, you mentioned that in China, that too few checks and balances limit the powers of the bad, uh, of a potential bad emperor. While in the US, there are too, ma too many checks and balances, what you call vitocracy, makes it difficult to, to make progress on building infrastructure, many policies that would be sensible. Which country in the world today, as you scan the horizon here, best strikes a balance between these two extremes? Uh, well, I would um, first of all say that there's a there's a lot of variance within both the kind of liberal and non-liberal camps, uh, and among uh, liberal democracies, the United States is you know is the worst in terms of not being able to act. We're so polarized, and we've got so many institutional checks that it's very hard to do things. I think. Many European countries are more uh, effective at that. Japan and South Korea actually can build infrastructure, I think, much more readily than uh, than the United States can. Uh, I'm not sure that they're at some kind of an ideal point. And I think one of the things to think about for the future is as the climate crisis worsens, the urgency of actually doing things is going to increase. Uh, and it's going to create pressures for decision-making systems with fewer checks. Uh, and I think getting that right is going to be a big challenge uh, in the future, because I don't think we want to go over to a full Chinese kind of system where there's basically complete discretionary authority at the, you know, in the hands of a single, uh, a single leader. Uh, we do want to have some some assurances that you know policies will be thought out and that there will be you know ways of checking bad uh, decisions or reversing bad decisions uh, but like i said i think that that still is going to have to be done on a nation state level uh, rather than you know through some kind of a supranational uh, form of organization Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much. I have uh, another question, which is very specific, that I can't pass up this opportunity to get your thoughts on. And this is a question from a friend of yours and former student, Selena Ho. And it concerns in particular how we began this conversation, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so what Selena and all of the audience wants to get your views on is, how do you see this Russian invasion playing out. You know, you have spent time teaching and building institutions in Ukraine. How is this, how is the Russian invasion going to impact some of this work that you put in, the liberal institutions that have been so painstakingly built in Ukraine since, uh, the, end well, of the, I, since the end of the Cold War? Yeah, I wish, uh, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, you know, uh, from the beginning of the invasion, I've been more optimistic about the chances that uh, Ukraine could actually um, win this war. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a blog post uh, on March 10th where I said that it's possible that the Russians could actually go down to defeat. <clears throat> and that's essentially what's happened in the north. I mean, they tried to invade, take over Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. Uh, they failed at that and they were basically defeated. And so they've withdrawn and now they're you know, trying to restructure their forces and make another push for a much more limited 
objective, uh, that struggle is going to be very, um, uh, probably much more bloody and the outcome uh, is less certain. The one thing I know, however, from my experience, I've gone to Ukraine many, many times, uh, especially since 2013. And I've worked with a lot of young Ukrainians. And the one thing that is really clear is that the morale uh, on the Ukrainian side is much, much higher than on the Russian side. Uh, something like uh, a quarter million Ukrainians living outside of Ukraine returned to Ukraine after the invasion uh, so that they could sign up, you know, for the military and, you know, help defend, protect the country. Uh, on the Russian side, people are leaving, you know, people that are educated, that have skills that they can take out of the country. They're trying to get out because they don't like the future that they uh, see for themselves. And that's replicated on a military um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the military operations as well. So it turns out, for example, that, you know, a lot of the Russian vehicles have simply broken down because they weren't maintained. Why were they not maintained? Because there's too much corruption in the, in the Russian military. You had officers stealing the money that should have gone into vehicle maintenance uh, and lining their own pockets with it. Um, you have a very weak NCO court. You know, the Russians have now lost something like eight or nine generals. And the reason for that is that they don't have junior officers that are at all competent. And so senior ones have to go close to the, the, the battlefront and then they get killed. Um, um, they've had tremendous problems with supply. The technology does not work, you know, nearly as well as they uh, expected it to. The Ukrainians have done much better in the information war. Uh, overall. So I just think that, well, I, I actually posted another little piece about this today. I think this really shows the limitations of a personalistic dictatorship. Uh, a lot of people have been noting that Putin in recent weeks, uh, because of COVID, has become incredibly isolated. You probably saw those pictures of him sitting at this enormous table even with his defense minister, has to be 25 feet away from him uh, because he's apparently scared of getting COVID. Uh, and, you know, in that kind of autocratic system, you simply can't uh, tell the boss something that the boss doesn't want to hear. Uh, they've evidently gotten very bad intelligence about Ukraine. They were expecting the Ukrainians to lay down their arms and welcome the Russians the moment they entered the country, and the opposite happened. Uh, and so now he's punishing the uh, intelligence officers, uh, you know, for not uh, warning him about this. I mean, uh, it's a system that's based completely on fear rather than on trust, whereas the Ukrainians really do have a system that in increasingly is built around trust and kind of, you know, unified national purpose. Uh, so I think that makes a great deal of difference in a in a wartime situation, and that's why I'm still betting on Ukraine rather than on Russia. Thank you very much, Frank. The, we, we're coming towards the end of the time we've got. So what I'd like to do uh, is to to hand back to you to see if there are, there's a general message you want us to take from first your earlier presentation and then this round of discussion. But I want you to, to, as you're thinking about that, I also want to ask you a very, very precise question that's come in from the audience again. And this is, do you have the impression that right-wing populists perform better than left-wing populists in elections in Western countries? And if so, is that because of among other things, the reasons you said, the, the, for the right, the issues are much more immediate. But also, do you think that there's a, a narrative that left-wing populists are missing? You know, they say the devil has all the best lines. Do right-wing populists have all the best lines? So two questions, one very precise about right-wing and left-wing populists, and then, and then finishing up with a general message you might want to give us. Over to you, Frank. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um... The left in uh, much of the Western world has really disappeared. You know, the French Socialist Party, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist. Although the Social Democrats are the leading party in the German coalition, 
they're much, much weaker than they were 20, 30 uh, years ago. Social Democrats across Europe have really not been doing well. Uh, and I think liberal Democrats in, in the United States have also um, found it very frustrating uh, uh, because the Republicans have continued to be strong despite you know, uh, many evident failures. The reasons for this are kind of complicated. Uh, part of it has to do with the fact that a lot of people just don't believe the, the left wing alternative, you know, you know, just have more redistribution, a bigger state and, and things will be fine because they've been there, they've tried that and it didn't work so well, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but the other big problem really has to do with the issue that I wrote about in my book, Identity, which is that the, the left does not appeal to people on these cultural issues. Uh, it doesn't appeal to people in terms of, you know, uh, appeals to national identity, uh, which continues to be a very strong um, driver. Most people on the progressive left are universal cosmopolitans. You know, they care about human rights in distant countries as much as, you know, their fellow citizens. And it's very easy to make fun of them for that. And that's what people on the right uh, tend to do. Uh, and there are, you know, frankly, a lot of traditional values having to do with family and loyalty and patriotism and so forth that a lot of people on the progressive left simply don't believe in or, uh, you know, think are outmoded. And uh, that's really hurt them. Uh, in the United States, um, you know, our problem, I think, is very much related to our racial history. Uh, after the George Floyd uh, killing and the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, a lot of progressives started advocating really stupid things like, you know, defund the police, which has to be one of the dumbest. I mean, it's, it's, it's dumb as a policy, but it's also dumb as a political pro, uh, slogan because nobody's going to vote for a candidate that wants to cut the funding for the police when you've got rising crime uh, and so forth. Uh, and so I think that, you know, a lot of people on the left have been pretty uh, confused. Uh, I don't think that the right uh, does better in terms of actual governance. Uh, it's actually been kind of a disaster in, in places where populists have actually taken over. But certainly in terms of getting elected, they've had an advantage because I think they're sensitive to the cultural uh, nostalgia and yearnings of ordinary people to a much greater extent than than people on the left are. Okay, okay. Um, thank you very much. And then some general thoughts in closing before you know I hand yeah, this back. Yeah, um, you know, I would just uh, refer back to the uh, fact that I'm defending liberalism, and I'm not defending liberal democracy, because I do think that liberalism is a bigger tent than uh, liberal democracy, uh, which, as I said, you know, would include a country like Singapore. Uh, I think that you can build a liberal world order around countries that accept, you know, the basic rules based international system that's been constructed without having to buy into the full you know, liberal democratic agenda of elections and, you know, uh, uh, contestation and, and, uh, uh, and the like. Uh, and I think that um, it's important to defend uh, those principles and to build a big tent because, you know, you do need, a, you know, a agreement uh, if you're going to maintain that, that order. Power, I think, remains important. Uh, I think that a lot of people in the West imagine that uh, power politics would simply disappear uh, because of the liberal consensus, and it clearly hasn't. And so I do think that, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, considerations of, you know, old fashioned uh, power and old fashioned power politics are going to continue to shape the way that our world works. Uh, we may not like that, but I think it's, you know, one of those realities that we're uh, going to have to face. 
Thank you very much, Frank, for, for that final statement. As usual, somber and level-headed, but also in all in its, its richness, inclusive. There's something in it for all of us to sort of chew on and, and think over. Uh, this brings the session to an end. I have to say, I've never seen the volume of unanswered good questions that remain. So one thing I can what one thing I might try and do to repair that is on the screen that will be flashed up in a minute is a link to buy Frank Fukuyama's book, the book that we've been discussing. I can say, having read the book, that it answers a great deal of the questions that other people are sending in. So please, I strongly encourage you, follow that link, go buy Frank's book. There's another link included in the, the screen that's going to show up. That's a, a link that takes you to a form that invites you to provide us feedback on this event. And that's very helpful to us at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, as dean of the school, I have every incentive to get these kinds of events even more on the road as our safe measurement, safe management measures in Singapore continue to streamline. And I hope many of you in the audience will participate in future events like this one and in person. I hope very much to be able to get to welcome Frank in person to the school in the not too distant future as travel again opens up. But for now, I want to thank everyone for your attention and your enthusiasm and all your wonderful questions. And of course, thank Frank himself for allowing this time, for, for his spending this time with us and giving us insight into all these really important questions. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you very much off. for giving me this opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye, Frank, and bye, audience.